All right, folks, welcome back to uh, week six, where we're going to talk a little bit about exposure. So to this date, we've talked a lot about uh, composition, lensing, storytelling, without focusing too much on the um, technical details of how to actually make an image and match it to our intentions. So we'll dive a little bit more in that today. And I think it's important to define exposure. So the idea of exposure is that we want to render a scene in a specific way using our camera controls to interpret the amount of light in a given scene. So what does that really mean? Well, we're going to dive deep into this, and we're going to look at each of the different camera controls, how they affect the image, and how we can utilize them to make different exposures. All right, so what's our goal with exposing an image? It's really to capture that intentional image, OK? It's to make a decision about how we want a, an image to look before we press the, the shutter button, OK? When you have a camera that's on auto mode and you press the shutter button, you're basically giving up all the decision making to a small machine, OK? And they're sophisticated, sure, but they're not intelligent, OK? And our goal is for us as intelligent operators to make the decisions for the camera, or at least override decisions that may be poor. All right, so I think what we really need to understand is what exactly is it that we're trying to do? And so in any given scene, there's some amount of light, OK? And we can use absolute measurements to tell how much that is. It could be, you know, 150 foot candles of light. But I don't know what that means, you know? I sort of, like, conceptually understand that, but it doesn't help me take a camera and make an image, right? I have to do a bunch of math. It gets very confusing. There's easier ways, all right? So what we really need is a relative um, uh, amount of light, or at least a scale, a relative scale, that we can use to adjust our camera settings. All right? So for us in this class, when we're talking about photography and then later cinematography, we're going to use the concept of f-stops. All right? And all an f-stop is is a doubling or halving unit. OK? So, uh, if, so if you have a camera that has some sensitivity, sensitivity and you double the sensitivity of it, that's one stop. If you have a camera that has some light coming into it and you cut the amount of light coming into it by one half, that's one stop. They're going in opposite directions, but it's an equivalent unit of one stop. OK? All right, so just briefly, to get a sense of like how this might look when we look at an image, we have here an image from Mount Auburn Cemetery that's at exposure, right? Roughly. OK? And I made this exposure using a DSLR, and the light meter that was in the camera sort of told me that if I set the camera settings to this, it'll be at exposure. And I think it did a pretty good job, right? There's no real complaints there. All right, so in an effort to sort of investigate how much difference a stop might be, I opened up one stop. So I allowed one, double the amount of light to strike the sensor. OK? And you can see that it gets much brighter. If we go backwards, right, we have some dark shadow detail in here, sort of neutral gray some bright white, and everything sort of feels naturalistic. We start to brighten up. That neutral gray sort of begins to push towards a lighter gray. This definitely begins to clip. These trees feel like a little bit brighter. Not completely unnatural, but getting there. So now if we allow four times as much light in, or two stops, remember that you're doubling each time you open up a stop. So you double, and then you double again. Now this image really starts to sort of fall apart. And this is the classic sort of overexposure that maybe you've accidentally done, or you've been struggling with your camera controls. And you end up here, where you have clipping uh, elements. There's no detail. There's no actual sort of shadow detail, no dark tones in this at all. It's all sort of light grays. And if we go even further, it completely sort of falls apart. And we could keep opening this, the, allowing the more light to hit the camera, and eventually we'd end up with like a solid white image. Right? So OK. That's overexposure. But when we look at this image again, at exposure, this is the same image from the beginning, and we go the other way, I've now reduced the amount of light entering into the camera by a half, OK, or one stop. And you can see that all of the tonalities get depressed, right? They're getting pushed down into sort of the shadow areas. There's more detail in that white snow, which was much brighter before, but now it's sort of a shade of gray. And if we keep going, two stops, right? So four times less light is reaching the center sensor. 
you now see like beautiful detail in here, but everything else is turning into sort of a muddy, crushed, shadowy darkness. Okay, and if we keep going, it becomes almost unreadable. All right. So all that is is to say that we have these tools that allow us to increase and decrease the amount of light, and we do so by measuring it in doubling or halving units. Okay. So how do we measure light? Well, we have a brief video online uh, that we posted earlier this week on Friday on light meters, which if you've all watched, great. And if not, we'll talk a little bit about as a refresher. But there's a few different ways. You can use a handheld light meter like this to measure light. But I think more often than not, what we'll use is the internal light meter of the camera. Okay? And so this will measure the amount of light that's on a, striking a subject and reflecting back through the lens onto some sort of um, light sensitive material. And it will say, if you set your camera to this, this, these values, you'll get a decent exposure. All right? So they can be handheld or internal to a camera, but all light meters are calibrated to expose for a, a, an idea called 18% reflective gray. And they do so in different ways, all right? So briefly, before we look at a couple different ways that they do that, 18% reflective gray is often sort of colloquially termed middle gray, right? It's the, when photographed, exposed properly, it forms the middle value between absolute white and absolute black in your image right in the middle, all right? So it's a very handy reference uh, tone for us, and it's usually found on a gray card, something like this, okay, that reflects back 18% of the light that strikes it, all right? Cool. So before we get here, let us quickly fire this guy up. All right, so this is the output of our camera right now. If we take a middle gray card and we place it in front of the camera, well illuminated, right? We'll fill the frame with it. We can see that in the middle of this, there's this histogram and sort of all of the image data is sit centered right in the middle, okay? If we set it for this white background, you can see that it's sort of drifted back to the middle as well. And that's sort of interesting because we would expect that this tone to reflect more light, okay? So there's a bit of a trick going on with light meters, with reflected light meters that we need to pay attention to, okay? Reflected light meters always assume that every single element that they're metering is middle gray. So there's a problem when you meter something that is not middle gray, like this white background, okay? And so if we actually are to, to open up um, this camera and allow a little bit more light in, what am I doing here? Whoop. There we go. I got auto ISO on. Okay, so there's the shadow. Let's get this shadow out of here so we get. So now all of a sudden we've brightened the image up by allowing more light in, and this tone is rendering normally, or as we would wish it to. Okay? So we can also do the same thing if we have sort of a black object, right? You can see that the camera, using the reflective meter, set this value to add exposure, which is lining up that small cursor with the carrot in that scale, you can see that this is not black, it's middle gray, right? It's actually rendering this incorrectly because what it's expecting to see is this middle gray card. So what we need to do in order to um, offset that is actually underexpose what the camera is reading. So now when we, we check this, the camera's like, you're over three stops underexposed, but this starts to look correct, okay? So we talk a lot about this, thanks Dan, for the second. Um, in the light meter um, video, and we'll come back to this, but that is to say that, that in any given scene, right, the exposure suggested by a camera is made to be 90% accurate, okay? Most scenes have a mix of light values, dark values, and values in between. So if you sort of assume that that all melds down to about middle gray, you can suggest an exposure, meter, and the, the meter will suggest an exposure, and when you expose for that, you'll be pretty accurate, okay? But so this scene here is pretty much all highlights, right? And my camera said, if you set it to these settings, you'll get a, a, a properly exposed image, right? But it's not, it's too dark, okay? So if we open up one stop, oh, we're getting closer. Snow's starting to look like snow. 
And if we open up one more stop, right, maybe we're a little bit too far, right? It's getting a little bit bright over in this area over here, but it's rendering as a very bright white. Okay? And sort of side by side, you can see it here, the metered exposure versus compensating by increasing our exposure one stop. Okay? So this is what I mean to say when I say that we need to be a little bit more intelligent than the machines. They're very sophisticated. They can measure all kinds of things, but they're still sort of locked in and referenced at specific values. So we need to understand what those are so that we can compensate and sort of use our intention to override the camera when it's making essentially a dumb decision. Yeah? Middle gray is meant to be halfway between true black and true white. How come mm -hmm. it's 18% and not 50? So it's, it has to do with the sensitivity of, or the way that our human eyes render light, and because it's logarithmic. So it's, like, it's, it's a power function, so 50% is not quite halfway on a linear scale when it gets transformed, I think. Um, but essentially, the, the, it is because if you have, say, all right, this is a good example. If you have one light bulb and you turn it on and you add another light bulb, right? It's almost like you've doubled the amount of, of brightness and it's a very obvious di difference. But if you have 100 light bulbs and you turn one more light bulb on, it's sort of a, such a tiny incremental distance difference. So we're dealing with light on this power function scale where we're doubling and we're having. And so the value that gets us to that middle gray is actually 18% and not 50% because it's not a linear scale, okay? So, which there's, there's plenty of math, and I certainly won't do it justice, but we can dive down that, that rabbit hole another time. All right. So we looked a little bit about what exposure is doing and how we might fool ourselves with a light meter, but what are the actual settings that I was just changing on the camera? Right, I was pushing and pulling at some, some sort of buttons and dials, and I was clicking some things, and the image was changing, but what was it? Okay. So there are three main camera controls. The first one is ISO. Okay, which is the sensitivity of a sensor to light, all right? or a film stock, or any kind of medium that we're using to capture light. All right? The second is shutter speed. How long do we let light strike that sensitive medium for? In the case of DSLRs, it's how long the shutter is open. Okay? But maybe there are other mechanisms in play on other cameras. And the final one is aperture. So in every lens, there's a diaphragm that opens and closes. And depending on how open that is or how small that is, it lets in more or less light. Okay, and that's a, a control that we have at our uh, disposal. And so by using all three of these elements, we can control how much light reaches the photographic sensor. All right, and how sensitive that sensor is to light more generally. So let's dive in a little to each of these categories because they're sort of different artifacts that happen when we, can, when we change and control each one of them. So first one, ISO. So it's, again, measures the sensitivity of a medium to light. In digital cameras, it's the sensor. In old film cameras, it's actually a type of stock, like film stock, and they each have different ISO values. So, and the sensitivity doubles and halves, right, which is that unit of a stop with e when the ISO value is doubled or halved, okay? And so I'm, in this little scale down below, there's some common ISO values. A few of them you'll notice are bigger than the other ones. Those are sort of, maybe you could call them major stops of ISO. When you bought film stock back in the day, it generally did not come in these sort of third stop increments. It came as 100, or you'd get 200, or 400, or 800. So sort of through that, they've become our major stops. And there's ISO values in between that digital cameras can replicate, okay? at third stop intervals or maybe half stop intervals. But every time you double the number, so if you go from 100 to 200, right, it's now twice as sensitive. And if you half the number going from 800 to 400, it's half as sensitive. And it works even with the third stop. So say we had our camera at 320 and we double it to 640, right? That's doubling the ISO value, that's one stop. We've increased the exposure value of the camera by one stop. And by default, most DSLRs that you buy, and, and mirrorless as well, will increment by thirds of a stop. So you can set it to half stop or only to do full stops, but by default your camera, is, as you kind of click up, and this is all the exposure values, is a third of a stop. Exactly. So, you know, it, when, when we were shooting on film, sort of predominantly, you would load a camera with a roll of film and you would have one ISO at your disposal until you finish that roll of film. 
So the flexibility of digital cameras is sort of amazing, right? Because in any given moment, you know, I had it on auto ISO by accident, and it was just sort of changing ISO to every stop in between for any different shot that we want to make. All right, so let's do like a little exercise, because I really want to drive home this idea of, of the relationality of stops, right? So if we go from 200 ISO to 800 ISO, how many stops difference is that? And is it more or less sensitive? This is a good time for the internet to chime in if you're on there and want to join us. Yeah? Um, I'm going like, to say more sensitive. It's more sensitive, but how much more? Two stops, it looks like. Two stops, right? Because we, we start at 200 and we go to 400 and then to 800. So we've doubled, then doubled. That's two stops difference. Absolutely, right? More sensitive. Great. How about this one? Ooh, so much math. It's all the arithmetic. 1,600 to 50. How about someone from Zoom? Anyone feeling brave? Carlos says five stops. Five stops. Yep, less sensitive, exactly. Very good. All right. How about 320 to 400? Oh, this is a little bit weird. All right, I was talking about it having and doubling being a whole stop. What do we think this might be? One third up. There we go, nice. All right, and this finally one where we have a sort of weird incremental stop that's maybe not one of those major stops, 500 to 1,000. Is it doubling or having? Right, it's doubling, it's going 500 to 1,000, it's one more st stop more sensitive, okay? This feels very basic sort of in the moment, and, and, but at the end of the day, having a firm grasp that when you double and have, you're, you're moving things in a stop increment is helpful because every other camera control also moves in stop increments, can be controlled in stop increments. So if you add a stop here, you can take a stop away somewhere else. Okay, so because there is no free lunch in anything that we do, and there are nothing but trade-offs, there are artifacts that are associated with different ISO values, okay? So increasing the sensitivity of a medium introduces noise. Does anyone have a sense of what ISO noise looks like or what noise is more generally? Yeah, so in, in the old days of film, it was actually grain, right? You'd see particles that were actually the, the molecular structure of the film was bigger so that it was more sensitive to light because there was more surface area. In electronical, or electronical, in electronic um, uh, systems, it's actually just random data that gets inter introduced into, um, into our image, okay? And so the more sensitive ISO values, right, the th that are, tend to have much higher levels of noise, all right? And lower ISO values have less noise, all right? It's much more apparent in the shadows of an image. Why do you think that might be true? Yes. Got less data in the shadows. Yeah, so there's less data in the shadows, right? There's no, val there's no information to overwrite a noise value. So you can see even low value noise in, a, in shadows because there's very little data there to begin with. Whereas if you have a lot of, like a bright highlight, it may overwrite sort of a medium level value of noise, okay? So you def the first place you're gonna see noise is always in the shadows. All right, so this is um, actually from a cinema camera. This is a still of our friend Dan Armadaris. And here we can see him sitting in this magnificent room at 400 ISO, okay? I don't see too much wrong with this image. I don't see a lot of noise anywhere. It sort of seems fairly clear and crisp to me. At 3200, now well, I can sort of start to see like a little bit of degradation, right? If we go back and then forward. Right, there's some, something there, okay? It's still not crazy, it doesn't seem from, from this distance. But then if we go to 12,800, that looks like wild, right? There's just so much textural element to it, so much noise. And so it's a little hard to see at this, that, that scale, so if we zoom in, we have Dan looking handsome, Dan looking, ooh, a little worse, and whoa, okay. So and you definitely can see it down in the shadow areas. And I didn't mean to make fun of Dan there. It's a handsome man. 
All right, so Ian, you, you were talking about the ISO levels, like at 400, mm -hmm. uh, I forget, something in the middle, and then 1200, mm -hmm. but does that, is that every camera the same? No, so every camera is not the same. Um, the, the range of ISO that values that you have available to you is hardware dependent, okay? So you'll find that, that certain cameras can go from 50 to maybe 32,000. Some of them have ludicrous numbers, like the A7S, I think, is like 120,000 or something, can like see in the dark. You know, um, whereas like a film camera might be locked into one ISO because you put 100 speed film in it, right? Or maybe your camera only has ISOs from 50 to 3,200. And maybe it only has half stop increments in between, it doesn't have third stops. So the range of ISOs that you have available to you is hardware specific, but the, the relationship is the same regardless of hardware. Doubling or halving increases or decreases the sensitivity of the medium by half or double. And my question also, uh, like 400 on one camera, is it the same as 400 on another camera? I would say um, no, because, because I, at the end of the day, the way the hardware is interpreting the electronic signals is different for every single camera. And so you may have one camera and say, oh, there's no noise at 400 ISO, and then use a different camera, and you may find that in a specific image there is a lot of noise at 400 ISO. Okay, and so there's, there's definite variability in the quality of the um, electronic circuits that are in digital cameras. And so obviously higher tier cameras are gonna do better at um, more ISO values than lower tier cameras. So, yeah. But sen so sensitivity-wise, they are the same, but there are definitely trade-offs yeah. between different models and different sensors as far as quality. Right, exactly. So it's, it's, it's has the same sensitivity, but you may actually end up with more noise, more artifacts in it because of the quality of the camera. That's a good way to say it. Okay, so why would you ever accept more noise, right? Like, the, why, would you ha why would you increase the noise? If it looks so bad, why would you do it? Well, it's a really pragmatic decision, right? Like, there sometimes is just not enough light. It's nighttime, it's dark, it's dusk. There's just not a lot of light. And so you need to boost up the sensitivity of the sensor to even render any kind of image. Okay, so there's a very practical side of it. Or maybe you're going for aesthetic effect, right? to mimic grainy footage. Maybe you're trying to mimic some surveillance footage or something like that. Or you wanna go back to a lot of street photographers used to shoot 3200 speed film and it always had really um, heavy grain in it. And maybe you like that kind of look and style and you wanna add a, a little bit of more noise into your image to mimic that, all right? For a textural effect, perhaps. Here's a picture of a ghost I took. I was ghost hunting last night. Do you see it? All right, well, you guys will have to investigate it later. Okay. Um, so shutter speed, right? So that's ISO. It's um, the sensitivity of the sensor. Increasing the sensitivity introduces noise. Lowering the sensitivity sort of minimizes noise, but it also requires more light. So there's a trade-off there. So shutter speed. So shutter speed is the amount of time the sensor is exposed to light, okay? There is a, a mechanical or a shutter in here. It opens for some period of time. The sensor is struck by light, and then it closes. All right, we measure it in fractions of a second, though you may see them written on cameras as integer values. This tend is to save space. So on those tiny knobs, you may see like 1,000. That's actually one over 1,000, 1,000th ,000 of a second. Okay. And listed there are sort of the major stops of shutter speeds. This is what you would find on most old school 35 millimeter film cameras, right? Starting at a second and going up to about a one one thousandth. So again, hardware specific, your camera may have more shutter speeds available to you and in different increments, okay? Or it may have less. But the important thing to take away is that doubling the length of time doubles the amount of light that can strike the sensor. Having the, the length of time halves the amount of light that can strike the sensor. So again, we're, we have this stop interval. So you could imagine that if I have to um, decrease the sensitivity of my sensor, maybe I can open the shutter for, a little, for, for twice as long. So go down one stop here and up one stop here, and it's the same amount of light, just manifesting a little bit differently. 
All right. So we're going to count stops again. All right. So a 60th to a 15th. One sixtieth of a second. I apologize. I shorthand a lot of this, but I should be more specific. So one sixtieth of a second to one fifteenth of a second. So it can be a little counterintuitive, right? One sixtieth of a pizza is more or less than one fifteenth of a pizza. That's how I have to do it in my head, to be frank with you. <laughs> how many stops? Yes. Two, two, stops. two stops, right? So it goes from one sixtieth to one thirtieth, one thirtieth to one fifteenth. Right? Two stops more sensitive or more light striking the sensor. One one thousandth to one thirtieth. So much counting. Alex has five stops. BM, five stops. Uh, okay. Uh, and that's wrong. That should say more sensitive. Okay, that's a typo. I apologize. Because we're going from one one thousandth of a second to one thirtieth of a second. That's much more light. That should read five stops more sensitive. I'll fix that before the end of the lecture. OK, so one five hundredth to one four hundredth. This is odd. That doesn't feel like a doubling or a halving. What might that be? A third, maybe? A third, right? Yep, a third more sensitive. And from one one eightieth to one one ninetieth. Those are odd numbers that weren't on our list. But it's still half, yep. Exactly, so it's one stop more. All right, so like all things that we've talked about, there is a trade off with shutter speed, okay? You can't just open up or slow your cameras, or open up your camera for as long as you want and still expect to, to render a crisp image. So this is an image of a dam that Dan took, and you can see that the water is frozen, all right? It was falling down, and it's literally frozen in midair. So this must be a very short sp shutter speed in order to freeze motion like this. OK? The blink of an eye. Here's the same image at, with the same amount of light. So technically, these exposures are equivalent, but they look very different. In this one, there's time for the water to fall all the way down right, and create this sort of streaking effect in the image. So this is a slower shutter speed. Right? What is it? Uh, half a second. So the shutter is open for half a second. Whereas in the previous one, what was it? One four thousandth of a second. I can't, that, that's sort of, unfa that's beyond fathoming to me. It's too fast. All right. And so this image takes a second to load. But you can see here a composite image that Dan's made that starts at very slow shutter speeds and moves towards very fast shutter speeds. Okay? And if we actually put the shutter speeds there, you can see sort of incrementally where motion begins to sort of look how we might perceive it normally into being frozen instantaneously or drifting into this fairy-like wispiness. Yeah, I mean, this kind of raises the question of like, how fast is fast enough, too? Right. So, I mean, it really depends on your subject, right? For for sports, maybe one 250th of a second is fast enough to freeze motion. Um, but obviously, to freeze water falling, you need to, to crank it up even further. So yeah. And, and also, like perception, too. Because when I think about you know, when I turn my tap on and what I see, I see something over here. right? I can't make out sort of individual drops unless I'm sort of tracking them. It's gushing. But it doesn't look like this. This is sort of very a 3 right? And it definitely doesn't look frozen in time like the one before. So, the speed of the object matters, OK? And sort of our perception of that speed as humans defines how what it looks naturalistically. Is that to say that human eyes are sort of equivalent to some f-stop, would you say? Um, I don't know. I th maybe. There are arguments online that yeah. yes, but <laughs> oh, I I'm think going back. it varies very much by person to person as well. Yeah, and, and, and I think the argument is, is you have to be looking at a fixed point, right? And everything, when humans sort of track objects, fast moving objects, f to achieve more clarity than maybe if, they were, if something passes right in front of your, your vision while you looked at, look at a fixed point. So it, it's a really hard experiment to perform because people's eyes are always moving. And if you move something in front of them, they, they just will track it. And you sort of get, a 
it's all skewed data, I would say. But there probably is some sort of upper bound of, of what we can resolve with our eyes just to, as fast as, as they refresh. So this is last night's snowy night. The snow is just streaking down through these wires. Here's another one with a tree, right? Just to go back one second yeah. to the, the previous conversation, I think it also largely comes down to something known as frame rate, which is how many images you see in a in sequence and what human perception is to believe something is actually in motion. And so I think that is a, a bigger part than like shutter speed, for example, as far as what feels natural and feels normal. And we're going to punt to the next lecture in here on that when we talk about video. Yeah, sort of idea of persistence of vision, right? You have you know, video is not moving images, it's a sequence of still images, and we perceive them as moving because they happen fast enough that we don't notice. So there is some sort of threshold where that happens. I'm just not convinced I know what it is. Okay, so to say that, to sort of jump back to that idea of we can actually track objects to increase the perceptive focus of this, this is a car that's driving by, but by panning with the car, okay, I was able to capture this in focus while the rest of it is out of focus at a much slower shutter speed. If I hadn't moved the camera at all, everything would be blurred. It would just be a, a large streak. And I think we should be careful with what you say is in focus versus what's not in focus, right? Yeah. This is actually motion blur, right. which is different from something being in soft focus. That is true. A very important distinction. Okay, so this is actually it. Um, as it moves across the sensor, you know, it ends up looking blurry, which is that, the idea of that motion blur, for sure. All right. So it does lead us to sort of this question that, that if, there, um, if shutter speeds get low enough, you can actually introduce shake or movement just from your own human body. It's, this camera's on a tripod, it's very stable. But if I hold something, I'm always moving, always. Let's try as hard as I might. So the rule of thumb is to minimize handheld camera shake, set your shutter speed to faster than one over your focal length. All right, so it seems confusing, but I have a 50 millimeter lens on here. In order for there to not to be any camera shake when I handhold it, I should be shooting it faster than 1 50th of a second. All right, if I put a 70 millimeter lens on here or a 100 millimeter lens, then maybe I want to shoot it 1 over 70th or 1 over 100. Okay, so especially this comes into play a little bit more too with zoom lenses where you might be zooming in and out and changing your focal length and not sort of paying attention to what shutter speed you're at. And you're, say, at a, uh, 1 70th of a second, and you're shooting uh, at 70 millimeters, but then you sort of snap into 200, all of a sudden you're going to introduce camera shake into the image. All right? A little bit of motion blur that reduces the crispness of your images. OK. So aperture, all right? The final of our three is the size of the opening in a lens. And we have like a little short video to sort of tease you with this, which we can just watch like this. So as the lens gets more and more open, what do you notice happening? The yeah, the numbers get smaller. This is odd. OK, interesting. All right. so. Aperture actually refers to the size of the di diaphragm opening in a lens, and it's a fractional relationship between the size of the opening and the length of the lens. So it, again, is, is written in this integer um, as integers or decimals on camera bodies and lenses and things like that, but it's actually like a fractional amount. So it's 1 over 2 or 1 over 2.8. So 1 22nd is smaller than 1 half, okay? And that's why this diameter of the opening gets smaller the larger the number gets, OK? It's a little frustrating and counterintuitive and can be confusing if you're not used to this. But with practice, I promise you'll, you'll grab it. So the major f-stops are listed below up to 22. You can have uh, smaller apertures like f32 or 45 or 64. And there are increments in between. There are third stop increments in between. You may find someone that shoots something at f9 or, or something like that. And you're like, well, that's not listed here. But, so there's increments in between. All right. And just to drive home the point that the smaller the f number is, the larger the opening. OK? So over here, we're in like 2.8. And over there, we're at f22. And so when you refer to the, 
the size of an aperture, you might just say f whatever the number value is. So I'm at f2, or I'm at f16, or f8, OK? To denote that you're talking about the size of the aperture and not some other numerical value associated with um, camera exposure. All right. So artifacts of aperture. Again, there are trade-offs with everything. So changing the aperture directly affects the depth of field of an image. All right? And we have not talked about depth of field except sort of in glancing blows in critique. And depth of field is defined as the amount of an image in apparent focus. OK? So in reality, the, with the way optics are, there's only one single plane of critical focus in an image that runs perpendicular to the lens axis. OK? And it's set at some distance from the lens. And if you look at your lens, you'll probably see that there's feet and meter indicators on there. And when you adjust those to a witness mark, that's how far away that critical plane of focus is. All right? But before we get there, I mean, that's sort of obviously not how we experience photographs. We often look at photographs where there's more things in focus on the z-axis than a single plane. OK? So there's some artifact that's happening in, when cameras make images that allow us to have more in focus than just a single plane. And that is what depth of field is. How much distance on the z-axis is an apparent focus. Okay? And we'll come all the way back around to depth of field in just a few minutes, but that's the concept that we're talking about. And aperture directly affects it. Oop, forward. So here we have an image of a young man in a- Handsome a, young man. What? A handsome young man. Handsome young man. In a, in a, in a swing, and I used dance, dance sun as my stand-in. <laughs> um, so, but you notice that the back of the image is out of focus, okay? If we, and so we're at what, uh, f1.4, okay? So in this image, which is a really large opening, really large aperture opening. If we go one more image, we're now at f11, so the aperture's gotten smaller, okay? And we've compensated for that with other exposure controls. But now you can see that all of this background is in focus. I love that he sort of looks over his shoulder at that point. <laughs> What's that? OK. And so side by side, you can see that these images, while the exposure is the same, right? The sort of brightness of the light values and the darkness of the dark values is the same. They look very different. You know? And so you can use depth of field as a creative tool. And it's often used to sort of separate people from environments to make things more intimate, OK? Or to show how expansive an environment might be if you go the other way, OK? Can, uh, can I yeah. give an easy way to remember the uh, f-stops? Yeah. Can you give a set of drawing for me? Yeah, I can. So I, to this day, have trouble remembering these numbers, just like uh, you know, you get to know the majors. But um, the easiest way to, for me to visualize this as you're going along is to start with 1 and 1 1.4. And so the nice thing now is you can just keep doubling along the way. So 1, you double to 2. 1.4 doubles to 2.8. 2 doubles to 4. 2.8 doubles to 5.6. 4 doubles to 8. 5.6 doubles to approximately 11. We round here. 8 doubles to 16, uh, 11 doubles to 22, and that covers most lenses that you'll pick up and, and operate with. So if you're trying to remember this scale, start with just remember 1 and 1.4, and then keep doubling. Quick and dirty. All right. So we talked to, oops. So I was sort of alluding to that these have the same, they're allowing the same amount of light to strike the sensor. They're just using different settings in order to do this. So that means that there is some sort of idea that you can have different exposure settings that yield equivalently exposed images with different artifacts. And so as a, as a photographer or an image maker, you have to make decisions about which artifacts you want and which ones you don't. Okay, and it comes back to that idea that we were talking about so much of intention, right? And supporting your sort of narrative story, okay? Because this image over here is really much, very much about this young boy, and this image is actually about this boy in a larger environment, right? 
And by making a decision to, to make, have narrow depth of field, we're focused in with the child. But to have expansive depth of field, we're sort of looking at the child in relationship to the space. All right, so exposure equivalencies. So we can expose the same scene with different settings and yield an image that is at exposure. OK? But how does the image change? All right, so to come back to this image again, this is exposed at ISO 100. So a lot of noise, not a lot of noise in that, do you think? Low. So low noise, probably. It's at f5.6. So is that a lot of depth of field or a little depth of field? Shallow or narrow? It's a middle-ish, so right, we could say. OK, and it's exposed at 1 100th of a second. So when we think back to the image of the dam with all the sequential shutter speeds on that, it's not super fast right, to freeze anything like uh, falling water or anything moving really fast, but it's fast enough to freeze most things. And it's also not slow enough to allow significant motion blur. OK. All right, so here's the same image. And we've changed a couple things. We're now shooting at ISO 400. So what have we done in the, compared to the last image? So it will be ISO. Uh, we were at 100 before. So we went 100 to 200, 200 to 400. So we increased the sensitivity by two stops. All right. But we also opened up the aperture by several stops and then closed or uh, shrank the shutter speed by a fair amount. But what you'll see is that we f1.4 is a really big opening and has a very or shallow depth of field. And you can begin to see that. Right? If we go backwards, you can see detail here, crispness. Right? And we go forward, and it's totally blurry. Right? And we know that that's probably not motion blur because we're shooting at 1 6,400th of a second, which is incredibly fast. Right? It's fast enough to freeze water or most anything that we would sort of deal with in our daily life. OK. So here's the, another version of this image. We're still shooting at a very high shutter speed. We're shooting at a deeper or a smaller aperture, which gives us deeper depth of field. But we're shooting at this really wildly high ISO, which introduces a lot of noise. And it's difficult to see, but we'll zoom in on this in just a second. All right. So again, just to go the other way, so we have f1.4. And this is 1 8,000th of a second, which there's not a lot moving in here, but there's, there's relatively no motion There would be blur. nothing moving even if there yeah, was. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But it wouldn't be moving if it was. Um, and it's sort of relatively benign ISO 640. Okay. And again, f22. And we noticed that the difference between f1.4, if you look at that gravestone in the very far background there, this guy here. All of a sudden, oop, I went the wrong way. At f22, it's sort of crisp, whereas before it was out of focus. All right. And Ian, you said a moment ago a benign ISO here, but yeah. I don't know that you defined like what is an acceptable ISO range. Like we talked about the trade-off of a high ISO introducing noise and a low ISO having less noise. But like in your maybe this is an experiential question. In your experience, yeah. wh like what would your target range be if you're going to go out and shoot something and wanted to kind of keep as little noise as possible while giving yourself a range? What what would you operate in? So I tend to sh to shoot between 100 and 400, and I think that may be just um, habit from uh, 30, shooting 35 millimeter film, where I would buy it in, at 100 speed or 200 speed or 400 speed, and mostly 100 and 400. Um, but I think, I, I think on any given shot, I'm willing to push up to like 800, maybe 1,000. And once I get past that, it just starts to, I need to really want to have the grain there because it gets hard to get rid of. Um, so I would say, Experientially, like, yeah, I shoot around 400. 400 to 800 is sort of what I shoot because it's sensitive enough that I can be in a reasonably dark situation and capture what I want. But it's also just not introducing enough, that much noise that there's a real problem when I go in and like, look at the images later. Yeah? Are you shooting full frame or crop? Full frame. Well, it depends. It depends which camera I'm using. So I'll, I'll shoot full frame, which means a uh, 35 millimeter size sensor. But I own cameras that have smaller sensors than that. Okay. And so the, the um, 
Yeah, and so and so it really depends on what piece of hardware I'm using. Again, all of these values and things are are dependent on the uh, the hardware that you have. Yeah, but I think uh, Ralph's question is actually interesting, right? Asking which size sensor is there a performance difference with a bigger sensor versus a smaller sensor? Uh, yeah, there is, right? Because you can have larger photo sites. So because you have a larger sensor, the the photo sites that are sensitive to light can be larger, which means that they are effectively uh, better at higher sensitivities than sensors that have smaller photo sites. So a full frame or larger sensor is going to have better um, quality at, at, uh, in lower light than something that has a smaller photo sensor. Or with a higher ISO. Yeah, with a higher ISO. I think you know all things being equal, if you say have like a small micro four thirds mirrorless camera at ISO 400, they're probably indistinguishable. I and mean, maybe if you really, really, really dig into the, the image, you can find it. But if you're shooting at say 3200 or 6400 or something like that, having a larger photo site, right, which means a bigger sensor is going to be more beneficial to you. That's where you're going to find that little bit of um, edge that it gives you. For sure, it's a good question. And then uh, I just want to highlight Alec said that the uh, there's vignetting on the lens is very noticeable between 1.4 and f11. Yeah, there definitely is. Yeah, you, you, like you can see it here, right? That so at 22, all the corners are bright, and at 1.4, there's this serious vignetting, right? And it almost feels like it's softening too a little bit. So, and what that is is that the coverage of the lens is sort of just getting a little bit too small for. The, the sensor size, and it's just not, a not quite enough light is reaching the sensor at that time. All right, so I'm going the wrong way. That's why they keep going. So if we jump in and look at the sort of this, this blow up, right? This is the first image, which was sort of medium values of everything, right? It's very vanilla, OK? This is 1.4, and you can see my focus was just off, OK? It's really hard, and I sort of left this in here as an illustration that, that you might think you have something in focus when, when you're looking at it at a, um, with a, a smaller aperture, but then if you open up, it may not quite be, your plane of focus might, quite, might not be exactly where you expect it to be, okay? And this is sort of very, like, this happens a lot. Like, it's not far off, really. It's on this bush here somewhere, but it's just too far forward. Like, I made a mistake. <laughs> and it's really unfortunate when you're shooting with a person. And, like, yeah. the, the thing you want when you're shooting a person is for their eyes to be in focus, because that's, like, the first thing that your eyes kind of typically go to. And what you perceive, when you perceive an image in focus, the eyes are typically in focus. So uh, if you notice that the focus is, like, just on the end of someone's nose, but their eyes are not in focus, it's definitely uh, a moment to kind of it's good to double check if you're taking a picture of people, I guess, to punch in digitally on your screen and make sure that the image is actually sharp. All right. So this is that image with a really high ISO. And it, I think it was a little bit difficult to see. But in, when we zoom in now, you really can see right, the noise just sort of introduced in all of this, the sort of texture. And you'll almost see like it's almost like a little bit brighter, too, because there's so much sort of added um, like bright data in the shadows. Right, sort of lifts them up a little bit because there's so much of it. So again, 1.4 again with my bad focus. <sighs> so frustrating. <laughs> right? But then if we go to F22, right? And this is what tricked me because maybe I, you know, I think I actually shot this one first and I was like, ah, oh, it's in focus. It's great. Okay, you can see that this background is in focus and this foreground object is in focus, right? So it has a large or depth of field. All right. So this should visually illustrate that we have the ability to have different exposures settings for the same exposure value, right? So if we think about a scene in this way, there is some sort of amount of available light that we want to sort of render. And we have three controls at our um, disposal to do that. And by increasing or decreasing one, we can increase or decrease the overall sensitivity of the camera to some amount of light. Or we can increase one and decrease another to not change the sensitivity of the camera, but to change the way the image looks. All right? So if we think about this, if we assume that our 
sort of base exposure that we metered returns some values like 5.6, uh, F5.6, 400 ISO at 1 60th of a second, which is sort of, again, not that grainy. It's not that fast, not that slow. Okay, there's not a lot of like room for motion blur, like someone walking would be fine. A car might be out of moving, a moving car might have a little blur to it. Uh, someone standing still would be fine, right? And the depth of field is sort of in the middle range, right? We haven't sort of figured out quite what that means, how much that means, but we know it's in the middle compared to 1.4 or 22, right? So let's make some decisions. Let's change the way this image looks, okay? And what I've done is I've filled in two of the three blanks with different numbers. How, so we should at this point be able to calculate what the empty space is. So, so like, well, let's walk through the very first one, right? So before we were at 5.6, and then we closed down one stop to F8, so we allow less light in, okay, by one stop. Here we're at 400, we're still at 400, okay? So we've allowed one stop less light in, so now we need to compensate for that, and we're gonna compensate for that in this empty square, so we need to allow one stop more light in to make them equivalent. Does this make sense? So what would the value be in that square? Yeah? I've got the internet. You're right here. Go ahead. Uh, Mouse says, should we go up to 1 30th of a second? We should. Well done. That's awesome, right? So we reduced the amount of light by one stop by closing the aperture down. So we had to increase the amount of time that the shutter speed was open by one stop. Okay? This isn't the only decision we could have made, but it is the decision here. Yeah, to maintain, to maintain our exposure, the same exposure that we had given by these yellow numbers up here. OK? All right. So now we have a different set of numbers. And again, we're still going to reference the yellow numbers. Don't worry about the bottom one, right? So we open up the camera from 5.6 to 1.4. OK? Can you go back to my drawing? Yeah. To go this far, I still have to visualize it. All right, so we're going from 1.4. Well, we started at 5.6, right? Sorry. sorry was the original exposure value, and we okay. need to, we're going to open up the aperture to 1.4. 1, 2, 3, 4. I won't say the final number. Somebody else can say it. All right. So we've added four stops more light by adjusting the aperture value. We still haven't adjusted the ISO value, so that's the same. So we now just have to compensate for four stops more light. Got a few answers from online. Well, so you tell me. We started at 5.6, and we're going to 1.4. Okay, we added, I thought you were talking about, okay, yeah, over there, over there. Right, so the smaller numbers are larger openings, which is sort of counterintuitive. But so we've gone five stops more open. So where would the shutter speed go to? You, had, you said you have an answer? I have a few answers from online. OK. Uh, so I have 1 over 240. I've got 1,000, 1 over 1,000, uh, 1 over 960. OK. So let's start with, we'll start with the lowest, and we'll go all the way up. So 1 over 240, right? So we were at 1 60th, and we've, we want to reduce the amount by four stops, right? Is that what we decided? So we go 160 to 1 120, right? 1 120 to 1 250, which doesn't match perfectly, but that's sort of the way it is. 1 250 to 1 500, and 1 500 to 1 1,000th. 1, That's our four stops, right? So we end up at 1 1,000th 1, of a second. And this is a good moment to kind of highlight this rounding that we do, kind of fudging of the math. Yeah. It's the same thing from 5.6 to F11, and we make that jump. It's not quite, but it's easier to talk in whole numbers than it is to remember 1 960th of a second. Right, exactly. And so you will find, as you sort of investigate some of these concepts, that, that some of the numbers are scales on the cameras, maybe you do have that fudge factor in like when you go from 5.6 to 11, which doesn't quite make sense because it should be 11.2, I think. Um, all right, so let's do this one here. 
So we were at 5.6, and we open up to 2.8. How many stops? All right, five, six, four, two, eight. Yeah, two stops. One sixtieth to one thirtieth. Opening or closing? More sensitive or less sensitive? More sensitive. More sensitive. Okay. By how many stops? One. So we add one more. So that's three stops difference. Okay. So now, if we were at ISO four hundred, and we've added three stops of light. How much less sensitive do we need to make that? There's so much arithmetic, it's annoying, I know. But I'll make you really good at it. Yeah, so we need to go down three stops. So what is the numerical value for that? OK, perfect. That's exactly right. Right? Great. Great. All right, so our last one. We've doubled the ISO, and we've done something with the shutter speed. How many stops difference is the shutter speed from 1 60th? Oh, I still have to do it in my head, right? 130, 115. So it's, you go from 1 60th to 1 30th, 1 30th to 1 15th, 1 15th to 1 8th. Uh, that doesn't make any sense, but that's what the number is. OK. So it's three stops. Um, more light, and we've also doubled the ISO, okay? So that's one stop more sensitivity, so that's a total of four stops. So if we take the aperture, we need to close down four stops from 5.6, so we just go the other way, we go 5.6 to 8, 8 to 11, 11 to 16, 16 to 22, F22. All right. And finally, this last one, boy, I don't even understand this one. We we'll go 400 to 320. That is not having nor doubling. What do we do? <laughs> yeah, it's a th let's say let's do the rough math. It's about a third. Okay, so I've got a third of a stop. I don't know how to do that with my fingers, so I'll just keep it in my head. Now we go from 160th to 1/100th. Is that a full stop? Full stop would be 1/120th, right? So it's two thirds, right? So now we got two thirds and one third. Ah, one stop. Perfect. Right? So we just have to open up to F4. All right, so it can get a little funky and it can get like you can start to sort of move in and shake things around, but you literally can make different images. Okay? So what does this image look like? This middle one. 1 4, 400, 1 1,000th one of a second. Yeah, okay, so we noticed that when it was at 1 4 with this lens on this camera, there was serious vignetting. So if we use this same system again, Right? We'll get serious vignetting. But what's the artifact that we really care about? It'll have a very shallow depth of field. What about things that are moving in that? Say there's some cars in it. Yeah, they're going to be frozen, right? One one thousandth of a second, that's pretty fast. It's a thousand pictures in one second. That's actually pretty ludicrously fast if I think about it. All right, so very net shallow depth of field, okay? But no motion blur. So blur because of depth of field, but, or lack of focus because of depth of field, but what about this one? F22 at 800 at 1 eighth of a second. But more than 400 for sure. So large depth of field, and then some motion blur, right? One eighth of a second. I can do a lot in one eighth of a second. Like I moved, right? A lot of dancing in one eighth of a second. Okay, so that is to say that like we can actually speculate at what these images look like, sort of abstractly, just by looking at the camera settings. We have an understanding of how to pre-visualize what a scene will look like at given settings. So when you're out photographing, you can look at a scene and be like, oh, so there's cars moving, there's some water flowing. I know if I set a low shutter speed, I'm going to get interesting blur. Cool, I want to try that. And you know that you can then increase or decrease the shutter speed so that you end up with more light, and then you maybe have to stop down. OK, I'm just going to increase your depth of field, which may be an interesting image. OK, I'm going backwards again. All right, so briefly, what 
do you think the camera settings were for this image? And we're going to talk abstractly, right? We, without sort of like digging into the image file, we don't know for sure, but we can take some guesses. Okay, so what are you what are so you're saying F11, but why are you saying that? Oh, well, less than focus. Okay, so there's a large depth of field, right? That's our first indicator. So we're going to say that it's probably a small aperture, F11, maybe higher, who knows? Okay, but like a small aperture for sure. What about the shutter speed? Relatively slow. Relatively slow. Why do you say that? Well, we don't, we don't know how much light was at the scene, right? We don't know. What we, can do, what we can do is look at the artifacts. So in the artifact of shutter speed is, is there motion blur? Is there not? Is there motion blur on certain things and not other things? Because that gives us an indication of how fast it is. There's much motion blur at all. Yeah, so I think you know, we're, there's, the water is rippling in some wind, and that seems relatively crisp. Like maybe there's a little bit of motion blur there, but it's not a lot. It's not sort of distracting, and it doesn't look like the water in the dam picture, which was super smooth and flowing. Okay. Carlos says 600 ISO. 600 ISO. What? Yeah. Why? So 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 why? <laughs> what is the reasoning for that? The logic behind that assessment. I don't see a lot of grain, so if that is sort of the, 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 the idea, like, yeah, there's not a lot of noise, okay? And, and so I think we could say that this, light, this scene probably has like a fair amount of light in it. It's a sunlit uh, vista, okay? And there's sort of a reasonably high shutter speed, a large depth of field, and some relatively low ISO, right? And maybe, yes? Is it like uh, another artifact of a low ISO good color reproduction? Because like when I saw the picture in the beginning with wasn't it? I don't know if his name was Dan as well. Was his name Dan mm -hmm. in the room? So like at four hundred, the colors looked okay. But when you went to twelve thousand eight hundred, it was just like blotchy, and the colors that weren't there started to exist. Yeah. So in that sense, right? Because noise is random, and it's not just brightness values; it's also color values that you can get random red introduced at a pixel or a, a bunch of other pixels. And so the, the, colorness, the color loses fidelity with the introduction of noise in the same way that your exposure loses fidelity. And you notice in that, that the graveyard image where it seemed almost brighter because there was so much noise in the shadow, it easily could have been like seemed more colorful, right? Or the colors seemed off and messed up because of like ran, random color data um, forming as noise. So yes, in that sense, absolutely. Yeah, and with the stretching of the information, basically your sensor is just like stretching the information that it does, it is able to collect. Um, as we saw, there was a lot more, when the noise comes up in the shadows, that can also lead to the perception of lack of contrast as well, because right. uh, there's just like more noise across the darks that seem to raise them more than they actually are. So there's better reproduction at a lower ISO because of that as well. So what's going on in this image? Hmm? It's like California. Maybe. Are they cormorants or pelicans? I don't know. High ISO or low ISO? Let's start there. Getting a lot of slow shutters, long shutter. Yeah. On the I think the most, the, the most sort of like dramatic thing about this image is the slow shutter speed that allows the water to blur. OK? And the depth of field is. I don't know. I mean, there's some definition in the water out in the far horizon and the rock. So maybe it's pretty large, right? But it's, it's you know, and I don't notice a lot of noise. So, but the most dramatic feature of this is someone is utilizing a slow shutter speed for, for an interesting compositional effect. And I would say it's low noise because when you have the sun, that's a powerful source. Yeah, right. So they may not need a lot of sensitivity, but we don't know what time of year, what time of day, right? This could be evening or early morning. So there's a lot of like, there's a lot of room for variation. Our error bars are large with that sp that sort of idea. But, yep, the sun is an incredibly strong source of illumination. So probably not something really, really high, right? And we also don't see any um, any artifacts of that. I don't see a lot of noise in the image. How about this one?
Yeah, so, so a very small f-stop, right? So our, 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 well, actually, I think we should say a small aperture opening, right? Which is a large f-stop number, OK, right? Like, I, we, just to be specific, because it gets so confusing otherwise if you're like, oh, it's a large f-stop, and you're like, but is that the big number or the big opening? Like, right? So. Yeah, yeah, it's, no, but just this, like it's, it takes muscle memory and practice, right? Um, so yeah, so, so this is really about sort of diving into a very small section of an image and letting the out of focus play as sort of a graphic element around that, okay? There doesn't appear to be a lot of noise and there's not a lot to suggest anything either way about the shutter speed, right? right? It's some sort of neutral value. But they made a very conscious choice to shoot at a very small or a very large aperture to get a shallow depth of field. Okay. Whoa. What's this one? Fast shutter speed, Lorna says. Yep, exactly. And not much to suggest. Uh, I mean, the depth of field feels pretty reasonable. I can see things in the background that are in focus. Um, water is completely stopped midair, for sure. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh, God. What about this one? High ISO. Yeah, I would agree. Absolutely. That's a good read. Fast ISO. Yeah. What about the shutter speed, though, too? This is sort of interesting, right? Yeah, but I would say fast as well, because they're frozen in the air. Yeah, they're frozen in midair, so it's fast enough to stop someone in, in mid-leap. But also they see in order to, to do that, they needed to boost up the ISO to make it more sensitive because it was allowing such little light in for the time. Yeah. Well, by boosting the ISO, and I think you could like the, the, the level of uh, grain in the image or noise in the image is sort of really apparent. One thing on this image as well, like you, we mentioned about color reproduction in high ISO. Mm -hmm. I think this image is like being made black and white, and that's one kind of thing that people sometimes do when they bump up the ISO is when you have bad color, is that you just make it black and white. <laughs> yeah, because the the color gets really mushy and noisy, and then the black and white sort of begins to feel like a textural, like compositional element rather than a, a degradation of of some other image. That's a very good point. All right, nope, backwards again. All right, so let's take a five minute break at uh, 7.04 and then we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit about depth of field because I've sort of been saying, oh, there's large depth of field and shallow depth of field, but we don't know what it is, all right? So let's demystify this when we return in just a couple minutes. All right, folks, welcome back. Um, so I wanna dive right in and start talking a little bit about depth of field, okay, as a creative tool and also how um, it works from a, a functional standpoint with your camera. All right, so depth of field is the amount of any image that's in apparent focus, okay? We've seen some images where there's only a tiny part of the frame is in focus and everything else is sort of blurring out in the foreground and the, mid or in the background. And we've seen images where everything from sort of the, the foreground object to the vast horizon in the distance is in focus, okay? So we need to be careful because apparent focus is, is sort of the linchpin of this. There is only one plane of focus in an image, right? And it's set when you adjust the focal ring on your lens and choose some distance at that witness mark, okay? The rest of everything that you perceive as in focus is a, sort of apparently sharp. It's sharp enough that like our human eyes don't notice that it's out of focus. Okay, so there is a threshold where at a certain point our eyes do notice that it's out of focus. Okay, and this threshold is um, much lower on smaller images. And as you blow things up, and I think you may have experienced this, where you take a picture where you, and it feels like it's sharp, like my gravestone image, and then I blow it up to a big size, and I'm like, oh, it's actually out of focus, okay? Yeah, on an 85-inch TV, right. <laughs> so, so there is this sort of relationship to um, how that apparent level of focus breaking down the larger you enlarge an image, okay? So 
the bigger print that you're going to make, the bit larger you're going to project something, the more important it is to make sure that you nail that critical plane of focus. And to Dan's point, we often, when we're doing portraiture, put that right through the eyes, right? So that we know that this person's like perfectly in focus and that as the depth of field grows, we'll get a sort of wonderful image of their whole face. All right, so what does this look like more generally? So this is sort of a funky diagram that I made, right? Where you have this sort of sensor plane that's inside of the camera, you have a lens, and then you have your sort of plane of focus out here, okay? Set to some distance. So one of the interesting things about depth of field is that it's not perfectly 50-50 surrounding that plane of focus. So the amount that's apparently in focus is one third in front of it and two thirds behind it, okay? So there's actually a little more behind that plane of focus that appears in focus than uh, in front of it, okay? And this is sort of a handy trick if you're sort of really shallow, you have a really shallow depth of field, right? You can actually sort of cheat that plane of focus a little bit forward, right? To make use of that extra space that's behind it, okay? Oh, I keep, do I keep going backwards? Okay. So we describe depth of field as being deep when there's much of an image in apparent focus. And conversely, when only a small arrow, uh, area is in apparent focus, we describe that as being shallow, okay? The three factors that control this are, are aperture, focal length, and the focusing distance of the lens. So the only exposure control that affects depth of field is aperture, okay? But other elements affect depth of field as well, okay? And that means the length of the lens, whether you're at a wide, normal, or tele, Okay, and how closely the lens is focused, whether you're focused at a subject really, really close in front of the lens or much, much further away. Okay, so to sort of talk a little bit more concretely about this, so the smaller the opening, the deeper the depth of field for aperture. Okay, so f22 will make a deeper depth of field in the same image than f1.4. And we saw some examples of that with the cemetery shot where there's sort of the background gravestone was out of focus, but then it was in focus, okay? The larger the opening, the shallower the depth of field, all right? And there's this little basic major stops down, down there, shallower going this way towards more open and the smaller F number and deeper going towards the larger F number, but smaller opening. So your rule of thumb to help you make sense of this is that doubling the aperture doubles the depth of field, okay? Yes. So it's a little bit helpful that if you sort of don't have you enough depth of field, right, you can double the amount of it just by opening up one stop or closing down one stop, I'm sorry, closing down one stop and adjusting one of the other exposure controls to give you a little bit more depth of field. All right. So big thank you to Andrew Markham for sitting in for us on this. But what we have here is a wide angle lens set to f16 with some amount of lighting in a space, okay? And what I wanna look at is not just our subject, but the area behind them, okay? And watch what happens as we play this image, this video. So what we're actually doing in this moment is opening up the aperture at the same time as we decrease the amount of light in the space. So we're actually like dimming the lights as we open up the aperture. And what you see is in the starting frame, when we're at F16, all of this sort of appears crisp, right? Maybe a little blurry, okay? But much crisper than this for certain, right? So this is a wide angle lens, right? Do you remember what, what focal length we were at, Dan? 25, let's say, maybe. It doesn't crop back enough. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, but it definitely is a wide angle lens. And then if we look at this same uh, situation with a normal lens, we'll see something interesting happen, right? Remember that I said that focal length increases depth of field. So here we are with a normal lens. The angle of view has shrank a bit, right? The camera hasn't moved. We've just tightened up the lens a little, okay? If you remember from Dan's le lecture. 
And we'll do the same thing again, where we start at F16, and we'll open up the aperture. And we'll actually just sort of dim the lights in concert. And if we look at this one, again, you see that the background is in focus. And then it's out of focus. But is it more out of focus than the previous one? Yes. OK. Yeah. That's sort of interesting, right? So now we'll move to a telephoto lens, right? Again, the angle of view cropping in, or not cropping in, but we'll run this again. And now it's really soft, right? Incredibly soft. OK? And this is the difference between them. And I would say that this sort of starting softness out here is, is not quite as crisp as it was in the earlier two iterations of this, right? But that is much, much softer. OK. So that's adjusting the, the aperture in three different situations, one on a wide angle lens, one on a, a, a normal lens, and one on a telephoto lens. All right, and by opening up the aperture, right, making the opening larger, we sh uh, shrink the depth of field in all three of those cases. It's sort of interesting sort of to see how it's different for wide, normal, and tele, and we'll come back to that in just a second. Okay. All right, so one of the other factors that affects depth of field is the distance to the subject. And what I mean by that is where your lens is focused. OK? Generally, I'm just going to sort of assume that we're focused on our subject, but perhaps not. But the distance that your lens is focused at, whether it's near or far, changes how deep or shallow the depth of field is. OK? The closer that critical plane of focus to the film plane, the shallower that depth of field is. OK? So the closer we're, our subject is to us, the shallower the depth of field will be, versus when it's further away, it's the inverse. All right, and our rule of thumb for this is doubling the distance quadruples the depth of field. So there's some power law here, yeah, right? Or having the the distance cuts it by four. So it's dramatic, though. It is. And, it is. And like I was shooting some macro photography this weekend, and you know I was at an aperture that was you know five six and you know f eight, and it was so thin, right? You think of that depth of field as being fairly deep, but it really matters how close you are with a macro lens, you're right up against your subject. And so this really right. like is exaggerated there. Right. And I think maybe even that image that we looked at that was the, the green plant with that really narrow depth of field might have been on a macro lens. Okay. Um, let me just go. What did I do? I went backwards again. Okay. So this is a wide angle lens where we're focused at four feet. OK. Look at the, the background. This is a lot of out of focus. We have our little rubber ducky there. And as we play this video, perhaps, no. And we move the camera further away from our subject, right? Maintaining racking with our subject, so moving, keeping the focus on our subject increasing that distance, you can see that the focus in the background begins to change. That by increasing the distance, the objects behind our subjects come into crisper focus. It's so slow, it's wonderful. It's like So if you think back to that duck originally, right, it was much softer than it is now. So you're same focal length. All you're doing is literally moving the camera but keeping the focus on the subject. Yeah, we're, so, so what, all, what, what that is doing is essentially changing the, how, where the lens is focused and just moving it like this. As the camera moves backwards, it changes that distance. 
So when you look at the starting position and the end position, you really can see how soft it originally was when we were very close to the subject compared to when we moved further back. So this is, a, again, a wide angle lens. So now we have a normal lens. We start a little bit more out of focus, right, in the background. The depth of field is a little bit shallower. Okay, and so if we do our little comparison again, we can see that distance to subject is really driving all, uh, how much depth of field we have in this in between these two images. And to do our due diligence, here's a telephoto lens. Notice how out of focus our our friend the duck is, and as we move through this scale, we'll see if we can get him to be in focus. So not quite, not quite in focus, right? The depth of field is still shallow enough to keep the duck out of focus, okay? And this is, again, a telephoto lens, all right? And if we do the comparison between the two, we can see that it's incredibly out of focus, almost unrecognizable to getting into some sort of shape that we can understand a little bit. What is what is happening? Okay. So don't steal my thunder. Okay. No, we'll, we'll leave it for a second. So this is what's called a dolly zoom. This is where the camera is moving back as the camera zooms in at the same time. So we maintain the exact same frame over a camera movement. Okay, and what you notice is we actually go from a wide angle lens with a specific, with this, this frame to a telephoto lens with this frame and you can see the actual spatial distortions that happen in real time, right? As you change, yeah, one more time. Okay. We'll look at this next week when we talk about video as well. Yeah. So this is sort of, I really wanted to show it because it's, Awesome. And one of the things that um, our final element, right, of, of affecting depth of field or controlling depth of field is this idea that focal length matters, okay? That a longer fo focal length, okay, yields a shallower depth of field. So 150, a 250 millimeter lens on a full frame camera, right? A telephoto lens has a shallower depth of field than uh, a wide angle lens, okay? Which yields a deeper depth of field. And I think we, we saw that when we looked at the, the, how different each of the elements were um, when they were in uh, wide, normal, and tele, right? The wide angle lenses had more in focus in the background than the telephoto ones, right? Regardless of the aperture. Yeah, regardless of the aperture, right? So, so well, Yes. So e when we were when we were changing aperture, right? If we go, let's whoop, let's go back here. So we were changing aperture here, okay? And you can see the effect that it has on depth of field. We didn't change focal length, and we didn't change focus distance, okay? When we go to here, and we change. Let's use this one. 
We don't change aperture, right? We don't change focal length, right? This is a wider angle of view. This is a camera backing up. OK, this is just the distance to the subject, and you can see the difference between, between the, the elements. But that is to say that, that this image compared to this image are two different, right? This is us changing focal length while all the other elements stay the same, right? We still shift it over distance, but this is a, its own unit, OK? So your rule of thumb for this is having the focal length quadruples the depth of field. Doubling the focal length cuts it by a quarter. Okay, that might be helpful for you in the field if you want to like I need much more depth of field, right? A little little rule of thumb to help you get there. The interesting thing though is that in this comparison, when we start at the um, at the beginning and the end, does the depth of field different, right? And I think maybe we'll do this. It's this, this side by side here. So this is, this is the dolly zoom that we did. We started um, with a wide angle lens, very close to the subject. OK? And we didn't change the aperture. We did change the focal distance. But then we moved the camera to a telephoto lens further from the subject. OK? So we increase the focal length, but at the same time, we also increase the distance to subject. And what you, if you look at this, it's sort of apparent, but it's difficult because we maybe don't see this. But the parts that are out of focus are sort of similarly out of focus in both of these positions. So that means is that, that as the focal length pushed the depth of field Right, smaller and smaller, the distance to the subject pushed it larger and larger, and they sort of offset each other. Right? Remember that our rule of thumb was if you change it by half, it doubles it. If you change it by half, it or it's, if you change it by half, it quadruples it. If you change it by half, it quadruples it. Right? And so those two values actually offset each other. So for the same frame, focal length doesn't do a lot um, to adjust your depth of field because you have to change the focus distance. Does that make sense? And they actually offset each other. OK. So um, if you, let's draw it. Maybe that's the easiest way. OK, so if we have a frame here, right? And we have a frame here. And they're the same frame, right? But for this one, the camera is very close. And for this one, the camera is very far. And for this one, we're at a wide. And for this one, we're at a tele, right? We've zoomed the lens out. As we, this is exactly what the dolly zoom is. It starts close. It moves this way. And as it moves, we zoom the camera in, OK? So what we've done is this focal length is getting larger, which we know produces a shallower depth of field, right? We're going from a wide to a tele. OK? And this focus distance, right, the distance from here to here, is getting larger, which we know increases the depth of field. So it makes it deeper. And in doing so, they essentially cancel each other out, roughly, right? Um, Yeah, so really what we're only seeing is the spatial relationships of the, of the foreground and background doing that sort of expansion compression trick, OK? Rather than like large portions of the image coming in and out of focus as the depth of field shifts throughout that entire element, OK? So that's just a little aside. That's sort of like a hiccup where if you, focal length really matters for depth of field if you don't move the camera. As soon as you start to move the camera, it begins to do less because you change your focal distance along with it. All right, are there questions on depth of field before we move on a little further? OK. All right, so one of the other tools in your art arsenal besides the uh, a light meter right, is this histogram, which is basically a plotting. It shows the distribution of brightness values of any given image. Excuse me. It can also display the distribution of color values. OK, but for our purposes right now, we're going to look at it as a luminosity scale. All right. And all this um, says is that there on it reads left to right. 
So this is black, and this is white, and everywhere in between is some mid-tone of brightness. And it just shows you how much of your image is falling in certain areas, OK? And so if this is, if this is full black, right, that means this area is probably our shadows. If this is full white, this area is probably our highlights. And somewhere in here is our midtones. So in looking at this, this histogram, we can see that there's a lot of data in the dark side right, of this with a big spike of white light at the top. And there's sort of nothing at the high, delicate highlights or midtones. Uh, OK. So this is a histogram. What do you think this is a histogram of? Overexposed. Yeah, so, so this is a histogram like of this, right? <laughs> just plain white, all right? Everything is just jammed up on that end, OK? So this should, should warn you, when you start to see your images sort of jam up towards one end, right, or towards the right-hand side, you're going to end up with something that's very bright, right? What about this one? Yeah, it's, it's this. It's just this. It's just black, inky blackness, right? OK. How about that one? Is this 18%? Yeah, this is middle gray. It's this image right here. Here's one for you. What's this? It's a lot of everything, right? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It's actually just this gradient. Right? It's equal parts of every, every sort of element, OK? And it renders a very flat histogram. So, okay. so, so but what's interesting about that is sort of this flat histogram, right, tells you that there's a completely even distribution of tones, right, which sort of suggests that that that's exactly what this is. It's about as even a distribution of tones as you can get, right, in any kind of image. Well, what's interesting too, like just to hammer on the point of like how to read this, uh, this gradient is on the left black, mm -hmm. on the right white, which is how you, a histogram represents its luminosity as well. But if you were to reverse this image, right, the image the histogram does not read left to right like an image does. It would be the same histogram. Yes. Yeah. What? Actually, that that yeah, exactly. Because it's just basically saying that there is a certain number of, of dark pixels in this image, right? And a certain number of light pixels in this image. It doesn't care where they are. Just there's this much value, right? So let's go back to this sort of histogram that we saw before. What do you think this is a histogram for? It keeps coming back around. It's like a boomerang. Alex has an outside shot. OK, an outside shot. That's sort of interesting. Why might we say that? Alec, also feel free to unmute and just shout you it can out. Unmount. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, my, my guess looking at that would be like your, your outside shot that you had, because there was so much shadow detail from like oh, in yeah. the trees and everything. Yeah, totally. It's the same shot. It just keeps coming back. Yeah, that's nice, right? So there's not a lot of highlight value in this image, right? There's a little bit of that snow, but most of it is this sort of dark tree value, which is sort of pushing the majority of our tones into this shadow area, right? But we see a pretty decent distribution of tones, and we have some highlight values, and we have some, some shadow values, right? And the very rightmost pixel here on the right side, we also have this indicator up here, and it looks different in different softwares, but this is the clipping indicator, meaning mm -hmm. that something is fully overexposed, meaning that it's true white. Yeah, and it honestly is, is the, um, it's the middle section in here. This is totally, like, there's some small amount of that that's clipped out pretty hardly, pretty hard. Yeah, so, so as, as you try to render tones in an image, right, you can essentially push up maximum against the maximum value, right? Which is like, it's, it's so bright that it hits the maximum recordable value for the camera, and then there's just no more data to record. So it just is at max. It's at full, right? Which is usually overexpo like clipping overexposure, right? It will show up as white because it's maximum red, maximum blue, maximum green. It's just pinned at the top, OK? 
Yeah, and the, exactly. And the opposite is where it is just crushed down to that black. And that's what those two extreme examples of the white histogram and the black histogram were, right? Where there was like all the values were just pinned at either the left or the right, either the highlight, maximum highlight value or the, the minimum uh, darkness value. Okay? And so once you clip, though, you can't get that information back, right? It's lost. There's no way to bring that back. If you sort of try to do any correction on that and bring the tone down, it's just going to shift in grayness, right? Because there's no detail. It's just bright white. It's a flat white field. And if you bring it down, it just will be a flat gray field. Or oh, you go all the way down to a flat black, right? OK. so. If we look at this here histogram, which is sort of the idea of a low-key histogram, it's pushed to which side? Which is? Shadows. OK. And right? We've got some midtones. Not really a lot, right? Yeah. And we have some and there highlights. there is a peak of white. What's that? There is a peak of white somewhere in there as well. Yeah, there is like a little bit of, of brightness, right? You can see it ticks up just at the end, right? Just a little bit there. So what do we imagine this image looks like? Fidelis is underexposed. A hmm? white dot on a dark wall? A white dot on a dark wall, yeah. <laughs> Something like that, right? Yeah, OK. So, so there's some small amount of brightness in a large dark field, right? It was a pretty good read, OK? This is probably our white values, right? There's the tiny bit of midtones that we were getting, and the rest of it is falling off into these very distinctive shadow details, OK? So you might have looked at, if you look at this histogram, like all tools, it can be fooled, right? This was an intentionally exposed image to have all of the values, right? To have this be dark, right? To have everything pushed to the left. Because that's the sort of the, the, the composition that this photographer was going for. But if you were sort of just looking at a histogram, you'd be like, no, that's not right. I'm looking for an even distribution of midtones. And I think you'll find like a lot of people suggest that that's the correct way. But it's not always, OK? It does matter about your intention, right? So the flip side of this is sort of a high key histogram, right? It's pushed to which side? The highlights, the highlights right? And just to, to just say plainly, like uh, we're looking at an overlay of several histograms here, right? Different color channels, right. and then the gray one represents the luminosity, right? But that just depends on which software you're using and what options you have turned on. Yeah, and so so you can get a variety of different scopes, and actually that's a, that's a good point because so the earlier version that we were looking at. Um, was sort of the luminosity histogram from Photoshop. And this is luminosity and color, like a compound histogram from Lightroom, right? And so you have different options that you can turn on and turn off, OK? And sometimes for certain images, having the color on shows you a cast or a skew that might be in there, especially if you did not set your color temperature. OK, so what does this image look like? Bright, right? I think we can safely assume that. There's not a lot in here that is actually a deep, dark color, right? dark tone. It's mostly whites, bright sky highlights. There's some grays in there. There's not even really a solid black, maybe a little bit of a shadow detail in there. Okay? And so when we look at the histogram, you really can see this. Okay? And so again, we're not using sort of that an even distribution, but we're letting, we understand that this is correct for our subject. OK? Sweet. All right, so putting it all together, all right, um, here is an image that is overexposed. Right? This image is mostly white. The values up, up here are completely clipping. Right? It's solid white. But it's OK because it's sort of the point of the image. right? So this is an intentionally overexposed image, right? We could meter this, and the camera might try to tell us to make this a middle gray, because it thinks that's what we want. But we know we're smarter than it, OK? So we're going to increase the exposures so that that pushes up to white and, in fact, clips. 
and we get an interesting shot of these sort of sunglasses, right? Solid marketing. All right, so then the flip side is, this is intentional underexposure, right? Where we've decided to not expose for this value, but actually for this sort of white value and give ourselves a silhouette, right? I don't, do you have the histogram for this one? Like, what does this histogram look like? Uh, I don't. I could get it in a second, but I don't, I don't have it. It's split though, right? We have yeah, very little split. in the middle because it's almost all at the, largely at the bottom because if histogram represents like 100% of the pixels in the image, most of them are in the dark. So that's going to be where our biggest mountain and the highest peaks are. Um, and then we'll have a, also a big spike up on the right because the, the white screen in that image was almost fully overexposed. So histograms, I think, most cameras have histograms on them when you're shooting. If you pull up your digital screen and push the, the button to pull up the display, you can cycle through different overlays on your screen. And so histogram is an option. But I find that they're much more useful in post-production. Like when you're actually out shooting, I think the thing you typically want to look at is your light meter um, and to know if you're getting a good exposure or not. Um, and obviously, you'll either intentionally shoot at exposure over or under. But at the end of the day, um, histogram is helpful when you want to look at overall trends once you get to post-production and, and really to check if you are clipping any information at the highlights or in the shadows. I think that's really where the histogram is best served. Yeah, and I think, I think actually um, I, I also tend to sort of you know, check the histogram early when I'm shooting, but when I'm pushing exposure in, in an image like this or an image where it's, it's really bright and I'm going to maybe push up against um, you know, overexposure or clipping, I will look at the histogram at that moment. When I know that like, I'm compensating and I want to make an image brighter and I want to push it up towards that sort of bright white value, I want to make sure that I don't clip, right? Because I can't get that information back, so I want to get as close to it while still maintaining some detail in the image, okay? So, so it is a, it's a really good tool for when you begin to experiment with pushing and pulling your exposure away from what the light meter is telling you. Right? At the end of the day, 90% of the scenes that you photograph, the light meter is going to do a, an amazing job at sort of calculating some calibration for you. Getting you real close. Yeah, it'll get you really close. But it, you then have to make a decision. Do I accept this or do I push one way or the other? Okay. And the other thing I'll just say, since we're talking about histograms, is the useful thing, the indicator that popped up. Um, in post, and we haven't covered Lightroom in this class, but if you're using something like Lightroom or Photoshop, typically if you hover over the indicator that you're overexposed, it'll show you an overlay on the screen where which portion of your image is clipping. Mm -hmm. And it's just helpful to get a read on exactly which part of the image is over or underexposed. All right. So um, I think that's sort of the tail end of our, our conversation about exposure. I want to stop for a minute and see if there are questions from anyone in the audience. What questions do you have? I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, will you introduce histograms? Uh, Dan briefly mentioned this, that we can see a histogram in our viewfinder or, or on the yeah. screen in our cameras? You can in, in um, a large number of cameras, and I think this is now turned off. So let me just fire up this camera. We can take a look. So this is the output of the um, 5D, and it's currently shooting this bright white wall. Okay, And you can see that the histogram is pinned, except when I walk in front of it, right to the uh, right-hand side. Okay. But if we do something like maybe introduce another tone, again, this is overexposed, we can see that the histogram starts to move. Right? This is a darker tone in real time for what it is that it's seeing. So in this image, I would look at this exposure and I would know that, OK, if, I'm, if what I want is a bright white field, I have successfully exposed this image. Right? But if I don't want that, if I want some kind of detail, Right? I'm going to adjust um, some values, like maybe I'll close the aperture down, which you can see I'm doing on the bottom. 
and I'll change the exposure so that now I don't have a bright white field, but I have a middle gray field, right? And I know that it's rendering as middle gray because it's sort of right in the middle of the histogram. There's this giant peak. I think, uh, can you push the talk? Is Sorry. That's so I assume right. you have to be on a manual mode in order for this to see a histogram and it's, alter all of these different. It's actually just functions. sort of like uh, one of the info features, right? I can actually turn off all of that clutter. Um, if I press it again, I get it without the histogram. I get some extra data, and then I can turn the histogram on. So your camera may or may not have this feature. Most do at this point. So there should be either a way to turn it on in the menu and or a button that uh, functions to allow you to turn this on so you can get a sense of what you're exposing for. Yeah. And Lorna, your camera may not have it in automatic mode. You might need to be in a different camera mode. Mm. And we did record a short, short video on camera modes, so we'll check that out after this lecture if you have more questions. And if I can just speak experientially for a second yeah. with histograms, like, like I said, I think when you're going out to shoot, I don't find them all that useful when I'm shooting, but the times that they are useful, if you're shooting in bright sun and can't quite get a read on your screen and you want to know if you're overexposed like on your highlights, um, it's really helpful in that moment. Um, but for the most part, I, when I go out and shoot, I am using exclusively the camera meter. Yeah. So. And I think that's a good point. Just like it's sometimes very hard to um, assess your focus on a very tiny monitor or through a viewfinder, it can be difficult. It can also be very difficult to see a, a LCD screen in bright sunlight, right? Which is, I think, what you're talking about, and that the histogram sort of proves to you what is happening in the image because it's not based on some visual cue; it's based on the actual data in the in the field. Okay. So again, there's videos. There's a, a video on light metering more generally and how to trick and fool your light meter, and also one on camera modes, which I would encourage you to watch for the next assignment. Uh, because there's a couple, we're going to ask you to experiment with the different elements of exposure. And you can use either aperture priority mode or shutter priority mode uh, to help you uh, play with that, as well as full manual if you're feeling brave and adventurous, which I encourage you to feel at this point. Uh, any final questions or parting thoughts? All right, well, we'll stick around for a few minutes and uh, let us know. But thank you all very much, and we'll see you next week.